Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the GABA-A receptors and the benzodiazepine drugs. Okay, so in this video what we're going to now move on to is the actual structure of the GABA-A receptor. Now that we've had some motivation, some insight into the role that the GABA-A receptor plays within the brain, uh, let's now look at its structure. So it is a cis-loop ligand gated ion channel, so I'll write that, which is what it's doing in a playlist on cis loop ligand gated ion channels. So ligand gated ion channel is often abbreviated to LGIC for short. Right, and I will explain to you what this means, where the cis loop comes from. So, um, if we draw the structure of the GABA A receptor now in the phospholipid bilayer. So here are here is the phospholipid bilayer of the membrane. And now here is our GABA A receptor. So it's a ion channel, so when it's in the open state it's going to allow chloride anions to move through. So it's specifically an anionic channel. It will allow negatively charged species, particularly chloride anions, to move through. And if we actually look at the structure of this pore, it isn't just one protein. Instead, it's a whole bunch of proteins stuck together. Specifically, it's five proteins stuck together. So it's what you would refer to as a pentamer. Okay, so pentamer just means that it consists of five uh, separate subunits stuck together. So. Uh, let's now pull out one of these subunits, so we'll take out this one, let's say, and have a look at the structure of this protein that makes up a fifth of the GABA-A receptor. Okay, and again I will emphasize that there is not just one GABA-A receptor, and this will, be, will make more sense when we actually look into this in detail in a moment, uh, but there are many GABA-A receptors, and we'll talk about the different types. So. For now, though, let's have a look at this stru the structure of this protein here. So, the structure of this protein here is that um, you have the amino terminus here, so this is the amino terminus, and then coming off the amino terminus, you then have a structure known as the cis loop. So this is a loop in the polypeptide held together by a disulfide bond between cysteine residues on the opposing strands. Then what you have is you have um, the first membrane spanning alpha helix, the second one, the third one, a large loop between the third and the fourth membrane spanning alpha helices, and then the fourth membrane spanning alpha helix, and then a C terminus of the polypeptide here. So let me highlight the different portions of this receptor for you. So the portions which make the transmembrane portion of the receptor are these membrane spanning alpha helices drawn in turquoise here. So these are membrane spanning alpha helices. And they are labeled uh, M1 is the first membrane spanning alpha helix, uh, M2 is the second one, M3, and then M4. So they're M1 through M4, membrane spanning alpha helix well, alpha helices, I suppose I should say, and they are labelled M1 through M4. Right, let's see some more important portions. So you then have this large loop between the M3 and the M4 uh, membrane-spanning alpha helix, and this is known as the M3-M4 loop. So M3-M4 loop, which is also known as the intracellular loop. So either of those names is appropriate. Okay, and this makes up the intracellular domain of the receptor. So this is the intracellular loop. Okay, and I want to stress again, this is the structure of one of these subunits. So you'll have five of these all coming together to make the whole pentamer, basically. Now, let's talk about this extracellular domain here. So in pink, we then have the extracellular domain. Okay, so this is the portion that's on the extracellular face of the enzyme, so I suppose I should label that up. This is the extracellular fluid, ECF for short, and this is the cytoplasm uh, beneath the membrane here. Okay, so this structure here, this is 
Well, actually, since I've labeled, uh, since I've drawn the arrow specifically at the cis loop, I suppose I should label that the cis loop. But I was going to label it just as the extra cellular domain. This then, this whole thing is the extra cellular domain. So the, although my picture is dominated by the cis loop, in actual fact, the extra cellular domain uh, is much bigger than just having this cis loop. It's not just two tiny little bits dwarfed by the cis loop. Instead, there's much more to the extra cellular domain than I've drawn here. But I w have emphasized the cis loop so that the name cis loop ligand gated ion channels now makes sense uh, because every single one of these subunits that makes up the pentamer has got this cis loop structure in. So, what is a cis loop? Well, basically, it's a loop in the structure of the polypeptide held together by disulfide bonds between cysteine amino acids, and the three-letter amino acid code for cysteine is CYS. So let me make this more transparent. So here comes the polypeptide of this strand here. So this is this portion here, okay? And then you have the amino group of this cysteine amino acid. Here's the alpha carbon, and here's the R group of the alpha carbon. Now, it would have a file group off here, so this sulfur would have a hydrogen, but it's actually going to be involved in the formation of a disulfide bond or a disulfide bridge, so we'll take the hydrogen off it, basically. Okay, so I'm being fortuitous. Okay, so then the whole polypeptide loops around like this. Whoops, you can't see this. Right, okay, so... The polypeptide, I'm representing the polypeptide as just a line now, and I'm specifically looking at just these cysteine amino acids in detail. But basically, you'll have amino acid after amino acid after amino acid. You'll continue this polymerization, basically. But because I don't want to draw out however many amino acids there are in between, I've just denoted it down to a line. Okay, so then you'll have the amino group of the next uh, cysteine amino acid here. Here's the alpha carbon of the next cysteine amino acid with its methylene group coming off here. And then here again, it would have a file group. So this sulfur would have a hydrogen coming off it. But instead, what's going to happen is these two sulfurs are going to bind together and the hydrogen atoms are going to go off. Uh, and this now is a disulfide bond. Okay, so it's these, this disulfide bond uh, which is holding the polypeptide in this cis loop structure. And the disulfide bond is also often referred to as a disulfide bridge. So let's now just complete this structure up. So here's the hydrogen off the alpha carbon, the carboxylic acid group, which will then be linked to the amino group of the next amino acid along. And this now is a cis loop, a loop in the polypeptide that is held together by a disulfide bond formed by two cysteine amino acids, and the three-letter amino acid code for cysteine is CYS. So this is a cis loop. Right, okay, so that's why it's called a cis loop ligand-gated ion channel. It's this pentamer, and by the way, um, cis loop ligand-gated ion channels can also often be referred to as pentameric ligand-gated ion channels, okay, um, because of the fact that they're made up of these five separate receptor subunits. I should also say that GABA-A receptors are a type of cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel. They are not the only type, though. They are not the exclusive member of this family. So other important members of the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel family include the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the 5-HT3 receptor, and I suppose I should just write jot a few of these down. So the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are all uh, within the cis-loop family. The 5-HT3 receptors all two of them are in the cis loop ligand gated ion channel family, and also the glycine receptors in the spinal cord are also uh, members of the cis loop ligand gated ion channel family. Okay, and what they have common to them is they're all pentamers, so there are all of these are made up of five separate subunits, and all of the subunits have the same membrane spanning topology, the same basic structures within it. Okay, but we're concentrating on the GABA-A receptor today, not any of these other forms. So let's talk about GABA-A then. So what would be fantastically simple is if there was just one gene which coded for the GABA-A receptor subunit. 
That would be ideal. If there was just one gene, and then to make a GABA-A receptor, all you had to do was take this GABA-A receptor subunit protein, transcribe it five times, translate the mRNAs, and get five proteins. Then just stick them all together to make this pentamer, and there's your GABA-A receptor. That would be what was would be lovely and simple. The reality is, it's not like that. Instead, there are 19 different genes encoding subunits of the GABA-A receptor. So there are 19 genes encoding subunits of the GABA-A receptor. Now, all of these will produce a protein which has this same membrane-spanning topology, although each of the different genes will have a slightly different protein corresponding to it. So the primary sequence of amino acids will be slightly different, uh, but they're similar enough to end up with the same membrane-spanning topology, and they can all be used to make a fifth of the uh, GABA-A receptor. Now, how should we intellectually manage these 19 different genes uh, for subunits of the GABA-A receptor? Well, basically, they've been categorized into families. So you have the alpha family, which consists of six genes in it. So it has the alpha-1 gene, the alpha-2 gene, and then it goes all the way up to the alpha-6 gene. So there are six genes in there, and they all code for slightly different proteins, but which can all be used as a fifth of a GABA-A receptor. Okay, excellent. Then we've got the beta family. This consists of three genes. So here's the beta-1 gene, the beta-2 gene, and the beta-3 gene. And these will then produce the beta-1 GABA-A receptor subunit, the beta-2 GABA-A receptor subunit, and the beta-3 GABA-A receptor subunit. And let me just bring this up here. Then we have the gamma family, okay? And the gamma family, again, has three subunits in. So gamma-1, gamma-2, and gamma-3. Again, these are all separate genes with slightly different sequences of organic bases, which leads to the protein having a slightly different sequence of amino acids, but they can again all function as a fifth of the GABA-A receptor. Then we have a bunch of genes that stand alone and aren't in a family, and often these ones are quoted before you then go on to another family. So you have the delta gene, the epsilon gene, the theta gene, and also the pi gene. So there's another four genes, and all of these code for separate subunits. So you, so far, you have these alpha-1 through alpha-6 genes. That's six. You have the beta-1 uh, through... Ooh, we haven't actually... Oh, sorry. No, this is fine. We've got the beta-1 through beta-3 genes. That's another three. Uh, we've got the gamma-1 through gamma-3 genes. That's another three. So we go up to 12. And we've then got the delta gene, the epsilon gene, the Theta, sorry, theta, it's a long time since I've done trigonometry. The theta gene and the pi gene. So four there, that takes us up to 16. We're missing three. So there is one final family, the rho family. Okay, and the rho family has three genes in it. Rho one, rho two, and rho three. Right, so you have these 19 different genes. Now, Okay, 19 different genes, that's slightly more complicated than one, but we could still have this ridiculously simple, we could still have GABA-A receptors where you just put uh, five of each type in, okay? So we could just build GABA-A receptors where you have um, alpha-1 five times, so in all five slots you'll have alpha-1. Then the next GABA-A receptor will be all five slots alpha-2, and you go on. That would give you 19 different GABA-A receptors where you had all of the fi five subunits the same, uh, made from the same gene, and that would be beautifully simple. The answer is you don't do that, not at all. Instead, what you do is you make heteropentamers. So heteropentamers basically are uh, where the uh, components of the pentamer, the um, proteins that you put into each of these slots, if you like, are different. They're made from different genes. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.